I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Revelation chapter 5, and we'll pick up the great throne room scene we've been looking at in our exposition of the book of Revelation. Smokey the Bear said, Only you can prevent forest fires. I don't know how that struck you. As a kid, that's a lot to handle. I mean, that's a lot of pressure. Only me? I'm the only one that can present, prevent forest fires. That means I've got to fling my body between every careless cigarette smoker, every spark from every freeway, and every reckless camper who didn't douse out all the coals in his campfire. It's up to me. And then I learned that many forest fires are started by lightning strikes. <laughs> Only you can... What do I have to do? Well, what does it really take to, to prevent all forest fires? That seems a little overwhelming. I don't know if you've ever been overwhelmed by any of life's problems. Maybe forest fires wasn't one of them. Our world's problems are, of course, much bigger than forest fires. And whose job is it to fix them? Who will end the madness of addictions? Who will clean up the filth in our society? Who will protect us from the drug cartels and the corridors of crime? Who will put a stop to the corruption, the injustice, and the double standards in human government? Who will dethrone the oppressors, those entrenched in power, who enrich themselves by backroom deals and insider trading? Who will dislodge bloated bureaucracies and big tech? Who will bring an end to the ceaseless machinery of war incited by the lust for power and the greed of the military-industrial complexes? Who's going to cure cancer and end world hunger? Who will stop the slave trade and human trafficking? Who can stop deforestation and pollution? Who's going to protect us from mudslides, earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, volcanoes, tsunamis, droughts, and famine? Our world is cursed. God has cursed it because of human sin. This is not the Garden of Eden. Humanity got kicked out when we rebelled against God, and no matter how hard we try, no matter what human ingenuity we put to it, we will never be able to reverse the curse. The great philosopher, King Solomon, asked the rhetorical question, who can straighten what God has bent? Ecclesiastes 7. If it's a rhetorical question, the answer is no one. What if it's not rhetorical? What if there's an answer to that question? Who, who can straighten what God has bent? I believe the answer actually is in the fifth chapter of the book of Revelation in your Bible. There is a singular answer to all of these questions, all of the world's problems. There is one who will set the world straight. Who can straighten what God has bent? Who can right all wrongs? Who can reverse the curse? Who can even undo death? The scene in Revelation 5 ushers in the final days of the world as we know it. The last moments of man's ruination of God's creation, of Satan's usurpation of the Lord's earth. This scene depicts the throne room in heaven as the final answer to the world's problems is sought. The fundamental problem of the world is found in Revelation 4.11. Look down at your Bibles. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, sings heaven, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, by your will they existed and were created. I say, that doesn't sound like a problem, that sounds like the solution. Yes, that solution, that song, that reality, that truth is sung in heaven. It is not yet seen here. The Lord God, the Almighty, is worthy to receive glory and honor and power because He created all things. But according to Romans 1, we did not honor Him as God. We exchanged His glory for corruptible things, and we worshiped and served the created thing rather than the Creator who is forever praised. 
that the earth has all of this backwards. That's the problem. So what will God do to fix it? The king himself will arrive here and set things straight. Let's read Revelation 5, 1 through 5, our text this morning. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. Let's pray. God, we come to your word this morning and we are humbled before the throne room. We look longingly into that future scene for to be there would be better by far than to be here. And in your good plan, in your sovereign providence, you have us here. On this earth, under the curse, for a purpose. That purpose cannot live up to what it is designed to be without our being calibrated by this text. It is good for us to be here. This morning we would build tents for ourselves and stay a while. We long to see your glory, O Lord. We long to see it manifest. We want to see your name vindicated. We want to see the saints in the earth vindicated. We want to see the Lord Jesus Christ esteemed. We want to see our own sins eradicated. We want our own hearts, our wills, our thoughts, our affections to rally around the heart cries of heaven and join the concentric circles of worshipers. And we pray that a a fresh view of this throne room scene would reignite our desire to live here as aliens and strangers, as pilgrims, longing for home. And we would pray as your disciples have prayed for generations and millennia, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh God, give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit says. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning in this chapter, we're looking at the solution to the world's problems. The opening scene of that solution. And we'll see this opening scene in five parts. Remember, this setting is in heaven. John the Apostle was transported across time and across space into the very throne room of God's presence, into that future event when the Son is being coronated as king, ready to level the the path for his arrival on the earth. John got to see what will take place at the end of this age. And we see in this scene, in chapter 4, God on his throne, the four living beings around the throne, the 24 elders on thrones around the throne, and all of them worshiping. But that worship is not yet reflected in the behavior of God's creatures on the earth. And by this point, for nearly 6,000 years, humanity has attempted and failed to make the world a better place. The day of man is coming to an end, and the day of the Lord will soon arrive. Here's the opening scene. The first part is a doomsday scroll. Look at verse 1. I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book, written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. This book of the seven seals is a scroll in the right hand of God. When John says, and I saw, this indicates a shift in focus. He is drawing our attention to something new. And the something new here is God seated on his throne and portrayed in his right hand, the right hand of his power and authority, is a scroll. Our English Bibles here say a book. And when we see the word book here, we we should think of a rolled up parchment 
Books as we know them came to be in use shortly after John's day, either early in the second century, maybe late in the first century, but in all likelihood on the island of Patmos, uh, such technology would not have been available. You know, a, a book with two covers and pages in between, bind, bound, binded, binded along the spine. Uh, that, that's modern technology, or at least post-first century technology. When you see book here, you should be thinking about a scroll, that which is written up on a long paper and rolled up. And this scroll was written on the inside and on the back. Okay, that doesn't make sense if it's a book anyway. But on a scroll, you can understand how on the inside, that which is rolled up and covered by the inside parts, uh, could be written on. And then the outsides also written on. In other words, this scroll is full of information. Uh, the outside writing may indicate that, that it is just full of data that is coming. It also may help us understand what kind of document we're dealing with. Why is there writing on the outside and the inside? We'll come to that. And this scroll is sealed up with seven seals. Ancient documents were secured. Uh, they didn't have encryption, uh, but they had soft seals, either moist clay or melted wax, then stuck with an impression that would dry and harden and it would keep a document closed and only the authorized recipient, the intended recipient, was allowed to break the seal, open the document, and read it. And sealed here is an intensive form of the word. This book, this scroll was really sealed intensely sealed with seven seals. It is seriously sealed up. And not just one seal on this document, but seven seals. Notice chapter 6, verse 1. The lamb broke one of the seven seals. And then notice verse 3. When he broke the second seal... Verse 5, when he broke the third seal. Verse 7, when he broke the fourth seal. Verse 9, when he broke the fifth seal. Verse 12, when he broke the sixth seal. And then chapter 8, verse 1, when the lamb broke the seventh seal. What do we see there? The seals on the document are broken in succession. They're not all broken at one time. And we should probably understand the scroll not to be sealed with seven seals all on the edge holding it closed, all to be broken at one time and opened. But we need to imagine some way that the seals can be broken one at a time with the breaking of each seal revealing new events. And perhaps the seals are on the edge of the scroll. If the scroll is rolled up vertically and sort of has a cap, that the seals are on that cap edge. And as you break one seal, you can unroll the scroll and see the first part of the contents. But not the whole thing. Now what is this seven-sealed scroll? This, in part, is the answer to the world's problems. What might come to mind for John's original readers when they hear about a seven-sealed scroll? Those who lived in the Roman world in the first century with some familiarity with the Old Testament. What would they think of? Allow me this morning to suggest a few realities that would be in the backdrop, in the mindset of first century readers that a scroll like this would have brought to mind. And by the way, these ideas are not mutually exclusive. It is possible that all of these ideas lend to the picture that is being portrayed here. And the first is a picture of a Roman will or testament. This is an official document with, with government sanction. It's a legal document like a will of inheritance. And Roman wills and testaments were often sealed up with six or seven seals. Now, this might have been in the mind of original readers. A second backdrop may be Ezekiel's scroll, according to Ezekiel 2, 9 through 10. Ezekiel receives a scroll from the Lord, and it is called a scroll of lamentations and mourning and woe. It is a doom scroll. It's bad news. In a scroll predicting judgments that are about to come to pass. A third referent, perhaps in the mind of the readers, would be the sealed land contract of Jeremiah 32. And I want you to turn to your Bibles, turn your Bibles to the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 32. There's some interesting overlap of language here and some very important concepts. 
And I want you to see this in Jeremiah 32, verse 6. The prophet reports this. The word of Yahweh came to me saying, Behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle, is coming to you, saying, Buy for yourself my field, which is at Anathoth, for you have the right of redemption to buy it. Then Hanamel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the guard, according to the word of Yahweh, and said to me, Buy my field, please, that is at Anathoth, which is in the land of Benjamin, for you have the right of possession, and the redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of Yahweh. I bought the field, which was at Anathoth, from Hanamel, my uncle's son, and I weighed out the silver for him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed and sealed the deed and called in witnesses and weighed out the silver on the scales. Then I took the deeds of purchase, both the sealed copy containing the terms and conditions of the, and the open copy, and I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, the son of Maseah, in the sight of Hanamel, my uncle's son, and in the sight of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase before all the Jews who were sitting in the court of the guard. And I commanded Baruch in their presence, saying, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware jar that they may last a long time. For thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards will again be bought in this land. This is an interesting scene. Um, we, we discover in this scene that Jeremiah is going through a legal process of purchasing land from a, a kinsman. And he's purchasing this land that will soon be overrun by the Babylonians during the Babylonian captivity. And he takes two copies of the land contract. One is sealed up, that is only to be opened by the rightful owner, the authorized recipient. And the other is an open copy to be read by those who would read the contract and understand the terms. Uh, they would know who could and who could not open this land contract. This is interesting because Israel is being exiled out of the land. You could think this is a terrible time to buy property. And God commands the prophet, buy property. In this spot, in your allotted portion, according to your family lineage and inheritance. And Jeremiah does. This is a, a tangible proclamation of faith in the promises of God. Look back at Jeremiah 25 and verse 11. The whole land will be a desolation and a horror. Not a good time to buy property. <laughs> and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will be when 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon for their iniquity. I will make it an everlasting desolation. And then he talks about bringing the people back. Look at Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. Jeremiah 29, verses 10 and 11. Thus says Yahweh, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares Yahweh, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. And look over at Der Jeremiah 32, verse 16. After I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, then I prayed to Yahweh, saying, Ah, Lord Yahweh, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you, who shows loving kindness to thousands, but repays the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. O oh, great and mighty God, Yahweh of armies is his name, great in counsel, mighty in deed, whose eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, giving to every one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. What does Jeremiah say after he buys the land, seals the contracts, and puts them in the ground? God keeps his promises. God is bigger and more powerful than geopolitics. 
He's got the whole world in his hands. And if God says, own this piece of land and I'm gonna bring you back to it, Jeremiah banks on it. And the deeds of land ownership are a tangible manifestation of his faith. Jeremiah's land contract was a demonstration of the promises of God, two copies buried together, one sealed, only for the authorized recipient, for Jeremiah and his descendants, the other open for public understanding of the terms. Jeremiah here was acting out the stipulations for a kinsman redeemer laid out in Leviticus 25. That is, if a a piece of land was in jeopardy according to the allotted portion according to tribes, a close relative was to redeem or purchase that land that was in jeopardy so that the allotted family inheritance would not pass out of the tribe, not pass out of the family, not pass out and be lost. And only a close kin could make the purchase. And that one was referred to as a kinsman redeemer. Jeremiah's land contract made before the Babylonian captivity was a public declaration of faith that God would keep his promises and the inheritance in the land allotments would stand. It's an interesting image behind a sealed scroll in Revelation chapter five. This image and the language used both by John and by Jeremiah has led many to describe Uh, perhaps another background of the scroll in Revelation 5, and that background is the title deed to creation itself. A title deed not to a little piece of property in the tribe of Benjamin for the prophet Jeremiah, but the title deed to all of the earth that belongs to its rightful owner, but is overrun by usurpers and rebels at present time. This thought builds on the idea of Jeremiah's land contract. It sees the seven-sealed scroll of Revelation 5 as the title deed to the earth. Originally, God placed man on the earth to fill it, subdue it, and to rule with sinless, selfless governance as God's sub-regent in creation. And very early on, humanity failed. With sin in the heart, mankind has, for all of our history, sought to reclaim the earth but not as authorized governors stewarding God's good rule, but rather negligent or brutal. Man's lordship of the earth falls to one of those two poles quite easily. We are either lazy or lording. We pollute the earth or we worship it. We cannot get this right apart from God. Satan is now the God of this world. And his is a dominion of darkness. God's image bearers are woefully compromised, handicapped, incapacitated by sins of every kind, selfishness, greed, idolatry, and malice. And as a result, the whole creation groans, longing to be set free from its slavery to corruption. And according to Romans 8, when will the creation which groans under the sin of humanity be set free? when humanity is conformed once again to the image of God, specifically in Romans 8, conformed as sons to the image of Christ, who is the image of God. As mankind goes, so goes the earth. God holds the title deed to the earth, and man must rule the earth, but mankind is in captivity to the prince of darkness. In Jeremiah's day, the Babylonians would lay waste to Jerusalem and the land of Israel, leaving it in ruins. But the promise of God was for the restoration to its rightful owners. This holds for the whole earth. The earth itself shall be returned to its rightful owner. The title deed is sealed up. The only authorized recipient can break the seals. And when that one opens the seals and enacts the land contract, the usurpers will be tossed out. The rightful owner will take up residence and his house rules will make for peace and prosperity across the globe. Now the text of Revelation 5 does not say anything about a title deed or the reclamation of the earth by authorized ownership. However, that is precisely what happens as a result of the opening the scroll of seven seals. That is exactly where the book of Revelation goes, culminating in the owner's return He will take up residence, he will punish his enemies, and the usurper will be incarcerated. 
that is where the book of Revelation goes. That leads us to the answer to the question, what is this scroll? I believe this scroll calls to mind a Roman will and testament. It, it reminds readers of Ezekiel's scroll of woe. I, I think it brings up to mind those images of Jeremiah's captivity land contract. And I don't think it's a far leap to see this scroll as something of a title deed to the earth. But none of this touches on the contents of the scroll. The contents of the scroll are the unfolding judgments of God. These unfolding judgments of God which prepare the way for the king's arrival to the earth to take ownership, to rule, to reign. And what is written on the scroll are not the fine print details of a land contract. They're not the, legali the, the legalese of a title deed or of a testament. What is written in the scroll are events. Specifically, the future cataclysmic events that bring about the solution to all the world's problems. The future historical events which Revelation 6 through 22 detail for us. What's in the scroll is the progress of God's redemptive plan. And His redemptive plan includes a judgment of rebellious earth dwellers. It includes the eviction of the great usurper, the God of this world, the, the liar from the beginning, the murderer of humanity, the enemy of God and man, the serpent of old, the great dragon, Satan. The unsealing of the scroll or the unfolding of judgments preparing the way for the arrival of the king unfold for us in three series. The first is the series of seal judgments. Each one of the seals opens, and when you get to the seventh seal in chapter 8, verse 1, that seventh seal results in the opening of seven more judgments called trumpet judgments. At the seventh trumpet judgment in chapter 11, verse 15, no specific cataclysm occurs except the opening of further judgments, seven bowl judgments. And when you get to the seventh bowl judgment, what unfolds is the culmination and the ending of the age of man. In final, obliterating, cataclysmic, heavenly judgments against those who dwell on the earth. All of that, of course, wraps up in the personal return of the king to his earth. These three series of judgments from seal judgments to trumpet judgments to bowl judgments work something like a telescope working their way out one from the other. They are all wrapped up in this scroll of the seals. According to chapter 6 verse 16, this is called the wrath of the one sitting on the throne. This scroll, this book of the seven seals is indeed the doom scroll for humanity. When the seals are broken, the contents of the scroll will not be read. The contents of the scroll will be executed. What the prophet Daniel was told to seal up must now be unsealed, meaning the events foretold must come to pass. And as Robert Thomas has written, the consequences of this scroll's contents are immeasurable and eternal. What is this scroll all about? This is a scroll of destiny. This is a scroll of doom. And it is a scroll of salvation. Its contents are the successive prophetic events that detail how God's judgment and his redemptive plan for the earth will unfold. How the rightful king will take possession of his creation. The second part of this opening scene is an angel's question. This is in verse 2. Look down at your Bibles. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? John begins this verse again with the phrase, and I saw. It's a, it's a shift in focus. It draws our attention to something new, and, and this is dramatic. John's attention is now drawn to a strong angel, an angel that's unnamed here. It does indicate that there are varieties of angels, ranks of angels, classes, strengths. And this angel is proclaiming with a loud voice. This is a booming proclamation. Now consider the setting. 
John has been transported from the Isle of Patmos in the first century into the future, into the throne room of God, into this coronation scene. And his attention is drawn to an angel. After all that he's seen, after all that he's heard, after all that he's witnessed, this angel's voice steals away his attention. This is an important question. This proclamation comes this way. Who is worthy to open the book and its seals? In other words, someone needs to do something with this scroll. The scroll is not designed just to remain in the right hand of the one who sits on the throne. It must be opened. Its contents must be executed. Remember chapter 4, verse 1? Jesus said to John, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. The events that are in this scroll are inevitable. They must take place. They are inexorable. They are coming and nothing can stop it. They, they are like that mountain cut out without hands that Daniel described that is rushing towards this earth and will obliterate all sinful human governance. Turn it to chaff and blow it away. It has to happen. Someone needs to open the scroll. Evidently, the strong angel, for all his strength, is not able to open it himself. Although angels throughout biblical history, throughout the book of Revelation, are employed to accomplish mighty deeds, amazing rescues, and devastating judgments, this strong angel is calling out for someone else. Who is worthy, he cries. The word for worthy, originally in a literal sense, meant something of proper weight. When used of a person, it came to refer to a quality of being, worthiness. And the question here is, who, by their weight of character, by their quality of being, by their virtue, has the ability and the authority to open this scroll and to break its seals? Now, if the contents of this scroll were merely information, just something to read and proclaim as a herald, then I suppose that many could qualify. God used angels to proclaim tidings, prophets to convey the words of God, even a donkey to reveal his will. The sun, moon, and stars, in fact, all of nature, shouts the glory of God's existence and his power, his eternal power and divine nature, his various attributes. And the human conscience whispers conviction in the heart. But none of these are sufficient to open this scroll. The scroll is not to be read. Its, its contents are to be accomplished. The events are to be executed. And who can rightly execute God's judgments on sin? Who can rightly redeem the earth from its usurpers? Who can vindicate God's honor and rescue his people? Who meets the standard? What qualities must one look for? One with a rightful authority, first of all, to fulfill the testament, like a Roman will. One authorized to break the security seal. Or, as we think about Ezekiel's scroll of woe and judgments against sinners, the only one who could qualify would be one who himself is sinless. No sinner could be the final executor of God's judgments against sin. And if Jeremiah's land contract is an intended backdrop for this scroll, we might also see the need for a kinsman redeemer, one with a legitimate relational claim to the land, who has the resources to pay the price required for its redemption. He must be kin, and he must be able to pay. He must be human in order to be a kinsman redeemer for humanity. And, and the earth which is made for humanity. And he has to have the resources to make the redemption purchase. And if the scroll depicts the reclamation of the earth, then the events that unfold actually secure the earth to its rightful owner, its king. And the Old Testament and the New Testament both make it clear the qualifications for such a king. We'll look into those. In short, we are looking for a holy and sinless judge a powerful king, a man with rightful authority. Who is worthy, cries the angel. The answer is the third part of this scene. We see next everyone's silence. 
and no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. The verb tense in the original is fascinating. It might read something like this, and no one was being able to open the book and break its seals. This particular verb tense gives us background information, the the sort of scene-setting background that sets the stage for the main action. John's response in verse 4 Uh, where he says, I began to weep greatly, Uh, probably began as an unhelpful addition in the New American Standard. It was just, I was weeping greatly. The, The same kind of verb tense is there. I was weeping much. No one was being able to open the book and I was weeping much. Not until verse five do you get to the main action, the answer to the question. But here in verse three, we have this ongoing situation, an ongoing dilemma No one is being able to open the scroll. No one being able to break the seals. No one is qualified to advance God's redemptive program, to judge the rebels, to evict the usurper, to bring low the arrogant, and to lift up the humble, to right all the wrongs, to straighten what is crooked, to reverse the curse, and bring God's shalom. No one. No one is qualified authorized or powerful to bring heaven to the earth, to to be the answer to the prayers of God's people these last two millennium. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so everything stops in verse three and waits for someone. Who? And notice in verse three how far the search has gone. No one in heaven No one on the earth and no one under the earth. No one under the earth is probably not surprising. No mortal who has succumbed to physical mortality, nobody in Sheol, nobody in the grave, no one who has been conquered by death could qualify. And perhaps under the earth makes reference to Hades, those who are already experiencing the judgment of God for their sins, though not in the final resurrected form. And it could refer to the dominions and powers and authorities, the, the forces of darkness and the evil in the spiritual realm that would, conclude, that would include the devil and his angels. And of course, from those parties, we, we wouldn't be surprised that no one could be found that was worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals. No one there to execute God's plan of reclamation, judgment, and redemption. And maybe this phrase, no one on the earth, is not surprising either. What person was on the earth in John's day that could have qualified to open the scroll? Nobody was there. What person has been on the earth since John's day that could possibly qualify to open the scroll? Well, we can't think of anybody. Have you ever tried to fix something and it only gets worse? I had the task as a kid many times to prepare the evening meal at home. My, my parents were teaching me to, to, to cook, uh, to, to get around the kitchen. One day the task was mashed potatoes. And, and if you've ever made mashed potatoes, you know that the, the ingredients are potatoes that get mashed. But that's not quite enough because potatoes need help. Uh, they're like a salt vacuum. You need, you need salt and spices. You, you need a, a really big tub of butter to go in there with the potatoes. And milk is helpful. And you put it all in a blender and, and you make mashed potatoes. And, and you get the texture to suit and the, and the spices and the flavors to suit. And in my early days of mashed potato making, there was an evening where I ran out of potato. And I had already put in too much milk and butter. And so it was kind of soupy. And that's not really what you want. How do you recover texture if you have no more potato? And all the solutions you're thinking that I thought of, you're already thinking, oh, this is going to be terrible. Well, I thought flour thickens things up. (laughs) I'm glad to know some of you have been in the kitchen. And you know from mistakes that that is the wrong move. It did thicken things up, and it turned it into something like paste. We could have made one of those uh, science project volcanoes out of newspaper and this paste that I made out of it was really starchy 
and gluey. It was no good. I had a problem and I had a solution and my solution made the problem worse. I don't know if you've ever tried a home improvement project where the opposite happened than home improvement, where the problems got worse and the fixes got costlier. I, I've, I've had those home improvement projects. And think about humanity. For all of man's attempts to pull itself up by its own bootstraps, for all of mankind's learning and achievements and ingenuity, for all the attempts to make the world a better place, to improve with knowledge or technology, to solve the world's problems, Listen, man can do a lot of things. There are vestiges of the glory of God in man that remain, even though the image of God in man is marred, as Calvin said, beyond all recognition. There is still a, a semblance of what man could be. There is a, a, a premonition, if you will, of what man will be. But man does not have the character, the power, the knowledge, the truth, or the authority required to reclaim the earth to its proper function. Man can't fix the curse. Pastor Todd Dykstra has said, there has been a constant effort on the part of man to win the earth back, believing that the scroll of human destiny lies in the hands of man. And every attempt is a failure. And we get enamored with our own progress we love the industrial revolution. We love mechanization. We love medical technologies. And no doubt to, to live now is more convenient and healthier than perhaps the 13th century. We're glad for any of those things. But none of those touch on the real problem of the earth. And all of our towers of Babel, where for our own glory we, we seek to reach heaven merely become piles of rubble. This is the way of things. Man's solutions without God will always amount to bigger problems. The 20th century, for all of the achievements of man and his technologies, erupted in the worst example of the slaughter of humanity at the hands of man by those very technologies. We might think we've improved, we may have increased our capacity to destroy. Consider your life this morning. What problems do you face? Maybe there are seasons in your life where you have, by your own ingenuity and stick to pulled yourself up by your own bootstraps and gotten through. You've grinned in the face of adversity, and you've come out the other side stronger. I would suggest to you that every attempt to get through life without God at best could be a temporary victory and not a true one. If you're in a mess right now, you need to know that your solutions to life's problems will never fix life's problems. Because the problems run deeper than your circumstance. You might think, my problem is I need a better job, I need more income, I need a different spouse, I need better kids, whatever it is. And your fundamental problem is you need a righteousness you don't have access to in yourself. You need supernatural power for living you don't have all on your own. You need a cessation of rebellion against your maker and you need to be in a right relationship with him. Seek first God and his kingdom. All these things will be added. You get that formula backwards and you will forever spin your wheels trying to solve life's problems with human solutions. You will always be found wanting. There's a reason there is always a market in our world for self-help gurus, instruction manuals, and influencers. We're looking for somebody who has the secret. And nobody does. 
except the Lord. And it's no secret. It's out in the open. You were made for eternity. You were made to know God. You were made in His image to reflect His glory. And when you stiff arm God's glory and God's honor and you instead worship and serve the created thing rather than the creator, when you dishonor God, you will dishonor the humanity and the existence for which you were created. You will forever be frustrated. You will always remain under the curse of God who has bent the universe so that you can't get from it what God originally designed. You were made for him. Until that is squared away, your life will always meet dead ends. And the answer is simple. The answer is the gospel, the good news that God himself came to the earth in the person of Jesus Christ to solve our fundamental problem, to take the sinfulness of sinful humans upon himself as an innocent substitute and take them to the cross and hang midair and be crushed by his father to actually pay for them all. All the sins of everyone who would ever believe to set you free from the judicial action of God against your sin, from the slavery to the power of sin, and one day even from the presence of it. If you believe in Jesus Christ, if you place your faith in him, if you belong to him, you have the answer. And it's the answer in the opening salvo of what God has done to fix the world. He fixes believers at an individual level. And there is a day coming when the king who came and was killed on a cross will be seen truly as the king of kings and return to the earth. In Revelation 5, 3, we have a non-answer from under the earth. We have a non-answer from the earth. But the silence in heaven is striking. Did you see that? No one in heaven is able to open the scroll and break its seals. The strong angel with the booming proclamation was silent. Those 24 elders on thrones, around the thrones, casting their crowns before him are speechless. The four living beings remain at their post. Not one of those magnificent, holy, fiery, powerful beings steps forward to execute God's plan. And we will find in Revelation chapter 5, myriads and myriads, sorry, myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands of angels At the very least, that means 404 million angels at the end of Revelation 5. None of them step up to take the scroll. In heaven, of course, are the Old Testament saints. Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, Isaiah, Daniel, the first Adam. They are all silent. None of these, though now perfected, are qualified. No sinner, not even a forgiven one, could execute this future. It was man's sin that lost the world. So no one from the New Testament era, no church age saint, no church history hero could answer this call. No one in heaven was being found. The silence in heaven and on the earth and under the earth makes it clear that all are waiting for the only one credentialed to redeem the earth. And if the Lord allows... And if he does not return for his church in the next seven days, we will see God's solution in our time together next week. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you that you are on your throne. That you have not yielded control of the universe in any ultimate way to the God of this world, to the prince of the power of the air, to any human despot, to any election cycle, to any circumstance, to any cancer or trial or difficulty. All of these things, though enemies they may be, yield to your sovereign will. They are all on a short leash and one day will all be eradicated 
O Lord, we live by faith even now. And like Jeremiah, we have banked on your future promises. And we know that heaven is our home. And that is the place where we will sing with myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands of sinless angels. Where we will sing with four living beings and 24 elders surrounding the throne and tribulation martyrs, and Old Testament saints, and the uncountable redeemed from every tongue and tribe and nation and people on the earth, we will sing, you are worthy, because you have created all things. You are worthy by right of creation. We are made, and you are our maker. And we will sing, you are worthy, because our King, Lord Jesus, You are the lamb slain who has purchased with your blood our very redemption and that of people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. In a preview of those moments very soon when we will see you face to face, we sing by faith.